Namaskar. May 19, 2021. Welcome to Daily Global Insights with Sri and Sri, episode number 166. Sridhar ji, we start with US news as always. And to begin with, Biden administration to let illegal immigrants use taxpayer funds for public housing. Vice President Harris says illegal immigration worsened due to climatic disasters or climate disasters. Your thoughts, sir? Uh, my thoughts are that uh, this is yet another scheme which is announced and confirmed by the uh, Housing and Urban Development HUD secretary, which is if the illegal immigrants apply for public housing, they would be granted housing and it will be funded by the taxpayers. So one more scheme uh, that goes all right in terms of uh, using the taxpayers' funds. Now, to compound the matters worse, somehow the Vice President Harris justifies the illegal migration or illegal uh, surge in the border is only accelerated due to people suffering from climatic or climate disasters, which is forcing them to migrate towards the United States. This unbelievable statement from the Vice President of the United States. And fuel shortage exposes Biden energy policy and as prices hike, Keystone XL pipeline strategy is in tatters. We have reported about this in previously also and uh, this is something that's fairly contentious because it also created a lot of jobs in the states of South Dakota, North Dakota, and so on and so forth. Sir, where do you think this is going to go? Uh, 19 states have opposed the Keystone XL pipeline bill. Uh, 19 states are opposing the EPA and the ban of uh, further drilling uh, as well as um, the um, the uh, the new energy policy that is being it's called as climate accord uh, and um, uh, that is something that is being offered or uh, being uh, legalized uh, through the executive order by mr biden what has now happened is uh, if you carefully take a look at some of the statements we'll analyze this as the dgi goes on i'm beginning to see a pattern of news biden makes an announcement white house rebuffs the announcement so if Biden is not White House, I'm not sure who is who the White House is. Uh, for example, on the energy policy, yesterday we had a statement from Biden, and then we had a statement from White House. Then you find it was Buttigieg who was opposing and supporting uh, the, um, the, res uh, the the resumption of the uh, the pipeline work by the Colonial Pipeline, as well as the um, uh, opening up the freeways for carrying uh, gas and opening up of some of the gas mines. So it's very interesting as to uh, how these policies are coming out as Biden's policy and White House policy. But we'll report that more on the matter. Where is this going? It is going to force when the prices go up, especially as summer comes on in the uh, uh, in the uh, you know gas. It's not tills. very far away. Just a couple of weeks. No, in the gas tills, you're just going to find uh, the policy progressively being diluted. To make matters worse, you have both John Kerry as well as Mr. Biden uh, driving around in gas guzzlers while preaching uh, electric cars. U.S. Senate votes to open debate on China tech bill, the Endless Frontier Act, and authorize 110 billion spending for five years. Sir, what is this China tech bill, Endless Frontier Act? It's the first time I'm coming to know of it. Endless Frontier Act is about... Uh, Investing in research, new technologies, artificial intelligence, 5G, etc., which gives uh, uh, grants to universities and research funded and sponsored by uh, the, uh, the government of United States, which puts United States ahead of the world. It's very similar to the space program, you know, that happened under the U.S., very, very similar to the spy program, you know, the, the, the defense programs that all happened under the U.S. government. This is specifically targeted at the technology uh, and the United States strongly feels it is disadvantaged. So this is very, it is disadvantaged, disadvantaged as it relates to China. So this particular program is earmarked 86 to 11, it passed in the Senate. So it's a bipartisan, uni, uh, unanimous support to spend this money. And uh, Speaker Nancy Pelosi calls for China games boycott. House Republicans call for probe of COVID origins. Um, I think both are concerning China. 
Why can't for once the house speak with one voice? Uh, one is house and the, uh, why, why can't they speak with one voice? Uh, well, you're going to see um, that on the China Games boycott, that bill will get through bipartisan and this is just mooted by Nancy Pelosi. Whereas the Republicans have been calling for the pro bond uh, COVID origins. If you recall, Trump and the Republicans called it as China virus. Democrats dismissed as racial and they didn't want it to be called China virus. Now, slowly, I think the uh, House Democrats may come around and accept, but this bill is being mooted by House Republicans. And uh, Republicans to present alternate infra plan, 800 billion proposal to be funded possibly with gas taxes and no rollback of the 2017 Trump Taxes and Jobs Act. On the face of it, it looks very encouraging, sir. What are your thoughts? My thoughts are that the probability of this getting through is very, very remote. Uh, however laudable uh, McConnell and Republican spans are. The original bill was 564 billion, which is purely for infrastructure projects, rightly so. But they topped it up with another $200 billion to give a leeway and cushion. They call it as the ceiling. But I just don't believe that this is going to get through because $2.25 trillion is well set in the eyes of, um, of, the, of the Democrats. Uh, they need climate accord. They need diversion to probably Palestine. They need to diversion of money to various types of activities uh, that they need to fund. So they're just not going to budge. So Biden may present a cool face and say he wants to do negotiation, but they may go ahead with their own plan. Sir, I'm just playing down, uh, looking down the road, five years, ten years down the road. Sir, some of the progressives are fairly well entrenched. As long as they stand in their own constituencies, they'll keep getting elected. Whereas around them, because others have much harder battles, they will start, you know, rotating like a musical chairs. So what I'm wondering is, what is wrong with this system? You're going to have more and more partisan extremist viewpoints 10 years from the round, from now. Uh, it's very much likely. What you're witnessing is the concept of appeasement policy as is often stated in India. So what you're witnessing is the rollout of the appeasement policy. The surge in illegal migrants or illegal immigrants is going to push them into certain states and into certain locales. Uh, you may want to call them ghettos or you may want to call them as neighborhoods or you may call, want to call them as whatever. You remember that there was also an infrastructure plan that uh, Mr. Biden has as part of the housing development to actually put right in the center of certain neighborhoods, uh, you know, tall rise buildings, uh, which houses some of these people to change the whole demographics. So what you're going to witness is the beginning of the journey of this change and shift in demographics whether that is going to scale and pervade over the next 10 years of time, time will tell. And also the progressive policies that you are alluding to, notwithstanding the fact that they may still continue for 10 years and 20 years being elected from those neighborhoods, uh, whether they will be able to get their policies through uh, remains to be seen. We have a very weak president. Um, there's almost a, an invisible hand pushing this progressive agenda. We have talked about this. So we're going to see some infra, in, interesting confrontation uh, evolve as time passes on. I just don't believe this is scalable. And in Indian news, India's economy will achieve its full potential once a vaccination reaches a critical mass, says Ashima Goel, RBI MPC member. Sir, what is MPC? Monetary Policy Committee member. She's the one. The monetary policy is, uh, is established to look at the general economic conditions and vote up and down in terms of the rate rises. And India's recovered patients rate higher than 422,000 per day as net active cases are coming down. Indian Railways reaches 10,000 tons LMO supply milestone. So what is LMO? Something to do with oxygen? It's, uh, you know, it's the liquid, um, that's okay. It's oxygen at the end, and that's fine. No, yeah. no, no. no. Uh, yeah. yeah, LMO is the oxygen. Um, uh, it's it's a milestone that the railways have reached. My apologies. I lost the stream of thought on the LMO, um, and uh, it's a great milestone. 
but we have already covered that Indian Railways is part of the cogwheel uh, and the supply chain in terms of, uh, in terms of by way of the uh, medical supplies. This oxygen seems to be uh, the uh, um, uh, it, does, it seems to be the essence of the shortage in India, and Indian Railways has come to the rescue. The message here also on the 428,000 is no paper, no mainstream media is reporting that we have now, India has crossed 400,000 mark in terms of the um, active cases, uh, sorry, in terms of the cured cases relative to the active cases, which goes up day by day. Today or yesterday, May 18th, they crossed net 110,000 reduction in active cases, which is a very big number. If this number goes to 100 to 200,000, you will find that um, you will find that that 3.2, 3.3 million active cases quite rapidly coming down, and the curve flattening in terms of the COVID management is concerned. And Reliance is going to build a 16,000 kilometer long submarine cable system to connect Southeast Asia, Europe, and West Asia. <laughs> it is Reliance's own border initiative. Well, uh, there is a very big debate which is going on around whether there should be public and private corporations bidding and laying down these cables and managing the broadband. Um, the fact that, uh, you know, uh, there is a very strong, I mean, you know, most of the uh, countries which are, you know, quasi-free market, they allow free, free enterprises to, to, to create these broadband capabilities, leveraging and complying with, compliant with the government principles. Uh, very contrary to the Chinese situation, very similar to Australia, Japan, uh, and United States. Okay, these are the uh, in this country. You know, when you talk about Japan, United States, Australia, and India evolving to that, most of the under under undersea cables are managed by private enterprises. And in global news, U.S. Afghan crisis crisis deepens. How so? Well, there's more soldiers are coming out. There's more incursions happening. There's a growing belief that whosoever are the civilians left behind, be it from the United States or from the uh, the, the broad NATO coalition, uh, they are left exposed uh, in conjunction with the people. The Afghan army is not in a position to defend itself. So you're going to witness some big casualties and fights evolve out of this Afghan crisis. I gathered today that uh, there was uh, yesterday, there's another report that's coming out. We now have Afghan Taliban. I'm told that there's also going to be a Pakistani Taliban coming into force. Many of these things, developments we saw earlier. And um, is the Bagram Air Base also going to be vacated by US? I heard it's pretty advanced state of the art. Yeah, it is. They're, going, they're, they're vacating everything. Barring some, uh, you know, uh, technical and contract forces, they're going to, whether they're covert teams present that we don't know, I'm sure there would be, but uh, but the, the mainstream army is, uh, is vacating Afghanistan. That's why the crisis deepens. And Russia's Nagurskoya base gets the facelift with missiles, radar, runways, with capability to handle nuclear capable strategic bombers. Where is this base located, sir? Arctic, up in the North Russia. So they are basically, Arctic base is being reopened. Um, and this um, uh, Nagruskoya base was dormant. It's now being reactivated. Um, and the airstrips are being developed, including to handle uh, nuclear capable uh, strategic bombers to take off and land. So they are augmenting their military capabilities, recognizing that in case there's any threat, they are well organized, um, well organized to handle the issues. B Biden's administration has been making more trips to Europe. Most recent tip trip is the Antony Blinken trip to the Nordics, uh, especially to Reykjavik, which is not too far. Um, and uh, Copenhagen and um, uh, Norway, and you know he is kind of he is basically boosting up uh, the the uh, the strategic partnership and strategic defense treaties as a coalition. So Russia is waking up and saying, "I'm not going to be uh, waiting and lying idle, and I'll organi organize myself in the event there's any incursions coming from the United States side." 
And Israel strikes Gaza tunnels as truce remains elusive. I know the progressives are calling for a, a ceasefire and so are some other countries. How do you see this thing end, sir? Uh, Israel will not end until they have achieved their objectives. Um, there's been two-faced comments coming from uh, Blinken and Biden, which is effectively to state that they, they are under no pressure uh, to call a truce. Uh, Republicans would not allow that to happen. Many constituents within the Democratic Party would not allow that to happen either. So I see this game coming to an end. The progressives, um, you know, there was, uh, you know, video clips played out, uh, Rashida Talib, uh, in the uh, Andrews Air Force Base as president was about to take take off, you know, having intense debate around uh, with Biden that was captured uh, on what, she, what they need to do with uh, the Palestinian situation. I don't think they're going to buy into it. And, uh, you know, unless Hamas uh, backs off, they're not going to stop. Hamas is not going to back off. And COVID virus surges in China and some officials are actually dismissed. So finally, some news is coming out of China that there is a COVID problem there too. There is clearly messages coming out that the virus is spreading in China, especially in South and Southeast China. Um, and uh, naturally, the first casualty is uh, in case, the, obviously, the news has leaked, so the officials are getting dismissed. Second, they have mismanaged it. So that's one of the reasons why, the other reason why they're getting dismissed. So, but there is... Um, there is definitely a problem looming in China. They can't insulate themselves um, and they can't say that somehow they are unique and they are not impacted. But the news is quite alarming that, uh, you know, China is also in the middle of uh, this, uh, this virus. And in Japan, Tokyo doctors urge cancellation of Olympics. Southeast Asia struggles with very low vaccination rates and a second wave now emerging. So your thoughts quickly on Southeast Asia viewers. We had a daily hangout today in the morning, uh, Piguru's prime time with Shantanu Gupta, the author of the book, The Monk Who Became Chief Minister, where Sridhar Ji actually explained the vaccination rates of various ASEAN countries. Sir, quickly for our viewers benefit, where do you see this going? Southeast Asia vaccination rates are very, very low. Um, you know, barring Singapore, which is around 27%. Um, you find that the vaccination rates on the lower scale ranges from 0% uh, to a high of 3%. Uh, there is significant shortage of vaccine availability right around whether you are talking about Malaysia, whether you are talking about Brunei, whether you are talking about Philippines, whether you are talking about Thailand, whether you are talking about Indonesia, whether you are talking about Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, and so on. So there's a very low penetration rates, and they missed the first wave, some of them, uh, but now the second wave is upon them, and it's, ca and it's basically they are seeing rising cases. Uh, it starts as about 400, 500 cases per day, and then the momentum picks up. Taiwan, which was considered the best in class, they are finding that they have now to shut down, uh, and uh, they have rising cases in Taiwan. Singapore, which was to start a Hong Kong bubble, um, has cancelled, is also under lockdown till I think end of, uh, end of May. So you, we, there is a major crisis looming in Southeast Asia in terms of shortage of vaccines. Center for Strategic Studies has made has prepared a paper and made a plea to Biden. You say you cannot have vaccines holding in the United States. If the world suffers, there could be complete economic collapse. So vaccines needs to be accelerated and sent across to all parts of the world. And in markets news, markets crash on sluggish housing starts data and inflation fears, the Dow drops 250 points. In fact, it went down 287 points, I think. So your thoughts on whether it's going to keep going down or is there a blip? Uh, it's very hard to um, speculate what the future looks like because of two factors. One, the housing starts slow is as a result of the labor shortage. If you recall, we have a labor shortage. Second, there is a migration taking place from some of this active or some of the, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I don't want to use the word affected uh, urban areas to more stable areas such as Texas, Florida, Arizona, and so on and so forth. 
So as a result of that, there is a shift taking place. The rate at which some of these houses needs to start is not keeping up with the demand. Though there may be a demand, the housing starts are, 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 are tipping, um, the land, sale, etc. The other problem is the availability of labor. A lot of people are getting free dole, there's no labor. So this is one of the things that was picked up in the April numbers. So market said there's a slow housing data. So therefore, is this the slow of economic, is this the beginning of the economic slowdown? So that's one fear. The second is, there's more cash. Uh, today we had the uh, PPI, you know, purchaser price index go up uh, yesterday, the purchase P P PPI number go up. So these inflation fears have been lurking. So you may begin to, this is more a sentiment rather than a fundamental. So whether the sentiment will continue to keep the markets dragged down for a period of time? No, the answer is no, because there is plenty of liquidity in the system and there's going to be more liquidity coming uh, down the pipe. There's still the $1.8 trillion that needs to come out. There's still the $1.8 trillion. This is the America child plan. Then you have to have the one, uh, 1.95 or 2.1 or 2.25 or 800 billion. That needs to come out uh, into the system. You're talking about close to four more trillion dollars of money coming into the system. So if by the time we get to 2022, we're going to have more problems, not in 2021. 2021 will experience the curve. But, but you'll begin to see the markets kind of move into to opposite territory in 2022, sir. And Amazon in talks to acquire MGM Studio to compete with Disney and the crypto market cap crosses $2 trillion. First, Amazon, sir. Uh, so James Bond is coming to Amazon Prime? Yes, James Bond looks like he's coming to Amazon uh, Prime, the Epic Studios. Uh, the MGM studios in Los Angeles, all of that seems to be part of the broad Amazon acquisition strategy uh, to combat, uh, to compete with Disney. Uh, so if Disney has properties and uh, various categories of assets and has seen uh, prolific growth in its uh, Disney Plus, uh, Amazon says, okay, now I'll have both content studios as well as the physical studios. Um, and, uh, you know, I will then as part of it get a huge uh, client reach. Uh, this is also the disruptive, transformative change that is taking place. And some of these big players are well positioned uh, and they seem to have the strategic agenda well laid out and they are maniacally going after. Crypto market, crypto we talked about, though market went down by about $1,200, $1,300, but the volume of activity has uh, has picked up and it's uh, it's crossed $2 trillion. Um, the gold is around, I think, uh, uh, $10 trillion in terms of the market cap, there's a strong belief that crypto will reach that market far more quickly and would be a comparative currency. Sir, which is your favorite Bond movie? Goldfinger. <laughs> Good to know, sir. And Yellen pushes higher taxes, stronger unions and more global competition. Now, um, I wonder if she would have said this thing if she was a federal chairman. Uh, you know, um, I don't want to second guess. It's quite astonishing. I've never seen anything like this uh, from a Treasury Secretary promoting taxes, promoting unions. Uh, and then uh, this is under the uh, Chamber of Commerce, American Chamber of Commerce address, and talking about the more global competition. Uh, and then uh, harmonizing rates around the world so that U.S. can be a competitive player. Who is going to listen? Is anybody going to listen? Actually, Rishi Sunak uh -huh. has already said no. If you if you follow what uh, he was saying, the yeah, UK yeah. Chancellor of the Exchequer. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, yes. I don't think any forward, uh, any uh, what what you call as the free market, uh, fiscal conservative, um, um, you know, leadership anywhere in the world uh, would be supportive of some of the schemes that is being uh, uh, that is being uh, you know uh, contemplated. And that the Treasury Secretary to come out and say it's a bit disappointing. Yes, indeed. And we'll be back again tomorrow with more news. Do watch our program. Refer it to your friends. Share it. Retweet it. And post it on your Facebook pages, our links. As always, it's a pleasure to be with you viewers. And we depend on your support for keeping this going forward. Today is 166. And who knows, we will be very soon at 500. So, uh, Sridhar Ji, Namaskar, thank you very much and we'll see you soon, sir. Thank you and uh, have a wonderful uh, day in the United States and uh, have a great evening in India.